Good morning, and it's genuinely an honour to be here today. And I was very excited when Michelle invited me, and then I got my first contact from Imogen. And at dinner one night, I said to my family, oh, "I've been asked to pre present at the Women in Industry conference on surviving in a man's workplace." And my husband, who's actually a commander in the Navy, looked at me deadpan and said, so why would they ask you? <laughs> he is still living. <laughs> I'm not on the front page. But I actually sat and reflected. My response, in, to put it in a nice way, was because you're actually asking me that question. And my research, when I was asked to present, I actually started reading, as, as I normally do. And my thoughts are that the conversation has diminished about not only gender but diversity, which you ladies referred to in the workplaces at for all levels. We, and my daughter said to me, but mum, you're not surviving it, it's done. Um, which is exactly what Mary was talking about. And my daughter's coming up to 15, about to choose year 11 and 12. Is she going to go into a trade or is she going to go on to university? Um, and that was my initial thoughts was that we need to ignite the conversation again. It still is happening. We need the support services. We need to make it a part of our, when we're sitting around the table, whatever workplace we're in. I then reflected on what is, what you know, cred have I got to talk about working in a man's workplace? And I think in my lifetime, the only place I haven't been in a predominantly man's workplace or a working man's environment was when I was at an all girls boarding school. And if you want to talk bullying and harassment, the Navy was nothing compared to an all-girls boarding school. The Navy was dead easy. Um, so I grew up on Outback Western Australia. My mum and I were the only women. All the workmen were men. I then I went to boarding school for a few years and then shifted to Libya, North Africa, of which obviously there are 50% roughly women, but you don't see them. And if they are in the streets, you only see their left eye. So it was a different type of culture. And at 15, that was a really good experience. I had a few years living in a very strict Muslim country under the um, guidance of Colonel Gaddafi. I then came back from that and joined the Navy, which I'll talk about very briefly. Um, I retired and became a consultant. And I was surprised the, the small number of women consultants that I deal with or that I engage with because uh, I thought there would be a lot more women out there sharing their stories and, and assisting people, but there's, my experience is there isn't. And then to be a female small business owner, um, Executive Women of Australia, which is a networking group, has been my lifeline because that means I can meet other women who are actually managing businesses because that is not a place where there's many women. So it was interesting to reflect on that. I joined the Navy at 20 and it didn't even occur to me that I was a woman entering a man's world just didn't enter it and, and there was only seven to nine percent of women in the Navy when I joined. Um, and, but what I joined for was adventure um, because that's what the ad said. Secondly was they decided, they offered to pay for my degrees, pay for my, all of my, because that was when HEX just came in, pay for my HEX, pay for all my books, pay for my rent, pay for my travel expenses. I was the richest uni student at Murdoch University. So I went, OK, then where do I sign? But the inner purpose after living in the Middle East, my biggest struggle was coming back to Australia. I did not like Australia for a number of years for the reasons that I think these ladies have discussed so far today, um, was I wanted to contribute to world peace. And that was my purpose. So that I didn't occur to me I was joining a man's world to bring about world peace. There is some perhaps naivety about being in the military and world peace, but let's not go there. <laughs> So in gathering that, I started reading about the, what did the suffragettes do? What was the feminist movement about? And it was about equality, I think. And the research is as, as recent as 2012 says, we aren't there. We haven't got there. Um, we've dropped the ball, if you like. And we, not necessarily just women, but organisations have dropped the ball. Of, and I started researching a lot of the researchers around university degrees and interestingly around lawyers. Um, more than 50% of women who graduate with law degrees, or more than 50 people who graduate are women with law degrees, in the higher senior leadership groups, less than 3%. So organisations can often get people, women in the door, but don't keep them. And that's one of the points that, that I think Annette or Fiona raised earlier. How do we keep them? My role now is I coach 
often senior people and often senior women in roles in organisations. So not necessarily executives, but women in leadership roles. And it's interesting, I often find the conversation is that the woman doesn't hold themselves or recognise themselves as a woman in that role. They will say, oh no, I'm not here as a woman, I'm here as a senior executive in, or I'm here as a leadership in, and whatever their role is. And they almost diminish and downplay the fact that they are a woman in that role. So they don't have the conversations about being a woman in this role. Um, and so I think that's what we need to reignite, and that's what these sorts of conversations and these sorts of, of meetings and gatherings and presentations do. Interestingly, there's a, a book was released, released last year by a woman named Cheryl Sandberg, and it's called Lean In, and it, she's actually the Chief Operating Officer of Facebook. And she put her experience in how she finds women tend to, when they're challenged, tend to lean back and head back and move away. Whereas she's called it lean in. We need to engage in that and engage it in the conversations and the challenge. And that's what I want to talk about today, my tips for doing that. So first and foremost, when I joined the Navy at 20, my first job, I had 56 men that worked for me. I hadn't turned 21 and had 56 men that I was in charge of. They were all older than me, between 23 and really old at 38. Um, they were all tradies. Um, they were weapons electrical, predominantly electrical trades, but the different types of electrical trades on board a ship. Um, and they were a whole lot more worldly wise than I was. Um, they knew a lot more about being in the Navy. But what the experience of managing these guys left me with, it's first and foremost that I'm a woman and then I'm an officer in the Navy. And I had to recognise that first. I spent 10 years wearing men's uniforms. Very embarrassing when I got issued because my hips um, are the size of a very big man. So I had to go to the extra large men's, you know, the big dude, kev, big kev section, get a pair of shorts that waist is this wide, so just so that it can fit around my hips. There is nothing more humiliating than have to get a, a belt where it gathers up until you look like a, I don't know, marshmallow, because we're in all white. Who thought of that? Not a woman. Put white on a ship. There's a good idea. Um, it was just, I spent, I spent, I probably, five, and I remember piping at sunset when the flag goes down and my pants falling down. Because you weren't allowed to wear, you know, with those those boys used to wear the seven crease. Yeah, not good. So I've been through that. <laughs> um, so how have I survived in a man's world? Let's look at this. I've come up with six ideas. They all, I found difficulty to, to separate them. They all contribute to each other. But first, I want just to bring your attention to this quote from Marilyn Monroe. I don't mind living in a man's world as long as I can be a woman in it. And that's one of the things I'm taking away often. so far. I haven't actually got there yet. It's still a learning process, is that I am going to remain a woman in whatever part of the man's world I am in. And that includes embracing my femininity. But first I want to do a really quick exercise. I'm assuming that you don't know everybody in the room. Just take two or three seconds. I want you to catch the eye of somebody that you perhaps don't necessarily know very well. Okay, so what I'd like you to do, I'm going to give you three minutes, maybe two minutes to keep us on time, of the time that I have, and I would like you to have a conversation with that person and from your history to this point, find a connection. Is it someone you've known in the past? Is it some school you've went to? Is it some connection that is real? Just take two minutes, engage with that person and find a connection. One minute. Okay, can I ask you to stop that conversation there? 
Could you indicate who found a connection? Who found a connection in their past? Oh, yeah, about, about a quarter of the room, maybe a third of the room found a connection. Who didn't find a connection at all? No one found those about, about four or five people didn't find a connection. Those people who didn't find a connection, did you laugh? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Can I invite you back to your seats, please? I think the most important thing over my time in, in, in the environments I've worked in is to remain connected. And that means have um, remain in contact with those who add value to your life. Has anybody ever had the experience of being in either a workplace meeting or um, a, you know, a workplace do or some sort of briefing and you might as well not be there? You might as well be invisible. Has anybody had that experience? Where you go to offer an opinion and, and they just brush over you and move past? So when, you, when you're in that experience, where do your thoughts go? Do you want to stay in the room or do you want to leg it? Where do you think you want to go? Yeah. People want to leave in that experience. Um, and that's the experience of when we're disconnected from our workplace and disconnected from those who work with us. And what we don't get, and to come back to what Mary was saying, we get reduced amounts of these experiences, fairness, certainty, status, autonomy and relatedness. We end up in what's called a defensive state. We start protecting ourselves. When we, it exacerbates in the workplace, we're isolated once, we're isolated twice, we get this story that we're no longer valuable, we start isolating ourselves from even family, friends and those who normally contribute to us. And we create the circumstance where we go, I don't know what to do, I'm out of here, and we leave our workplace. This is the area I predominantly work in nowadays, is people who have had that experience, where they're disconnected. Often when they get that experience of being isolated, they start behaving differently. They start doing things differently. And when I sit down as a coach with them and say, if you reflect on what you did at that meeting, is that how you want to see yourself? And without exception, every one of them have said, no, nah, that's not how I want to be. That's not my story as a whatever I'm doing, as a tradie, as a doctor, as a, that's not me. So we start behaving incongruent with our expectations of ourselves, our vision of how we were going to be in this world, but also with our values and beliefs. So from that, my learning was to hang on, to create those connections for starters. If I'm walking into a room of strangers, find something that you can connect with them. And even if it's not, you don't find, find anything, if you laugh, that's a great connector. Then maintain them and build on them. And keep those that have added value to your life to date close at hand keep them healthy and moving. So that would be my first, is, is remain connected. Keep those connections. When you start researching motivation in workplaces, it's these values, if you like, that will cause people to, that we would judge as demotivated. When the sense of fairness, certainty, status, autonomy and relatedness is removed or eliminated from a workplace, people will be unmotivated. They're not going to work. Why would you want to work somewhere that you think that you have no role, that people don't treat you fairly or don't care about you? Why would you want to? Whereas if you build those into your staff and into your apprentices, they will be there. They'll be your 20-year apprentice. They'll be there for many, many years. So how do we do it? There's a number of things, and one of the things I wanted to, to highlight, which we've briefly talked about, is accepting and asking for feedback, listening to stories, sharing your knowledge, wisdom and experience, not hanging on to it for yourself, being curious about others' experience. A big one that I found is that sense of dress. What am I wearing? Um, the, the data indicates that women are judged by their dress before they, what they say. So you walk into a room and yeah, what you look like is going to influence what they hear you say. Whereas men are judged on what they say, not what they're wearing. So, you know, they could be, and I've seen many exceptions here, many a man in a very ill-fitting suit um, who stands up there and people applaud what he's got to say. Um, and a woman who gets up there in an ill-fitting suit and they don't even listen. Um, so, right or wrong, how you appear 
will influence whether they hear what you're going to say. Um, another part of that connection is, is and I want to reiterate on what these ladies said about women supporting women. The only, I've, I've been through, I mean, I've done time in, the, in all sorts of circumstances. I mean, go, go do military observer stuff in a peace environment. Um, the one that's damaged me most has been a fellow woman. So I can take crap, excuse my language, I heard somebody else use that. I can take the crap from, <laughs> from the men. I can actually, I'm very resilient in that. But I had a woman say to me once, I'd been travelling for six months, I'd literally only had my butt in my chair in my office for three days. I came in on the June long weekend on the Thursday and I asked if I could have Friday off because on Tuesday I was going to the Philippines to do some work. My boss, who was a woman, said to me, if you were meant to have a family, you would be issued with one and didn't give me the day off. So whilst it was tongue in cheek, there was a sense of real in, in that. It was the sense of that. So those that have damaged me most in my career have been women. And the lack of support. So that would be, do that. My second one, moving forward. Adopt clear communication. Um, clean and clear. I have a tool here. First, we all communicate differently. Whether we be men, women, what age we are, what, I mean, when I was in Navy recruiting, whether they came from Tasmania or Queensland, they communicate differently. Or Western Australia. I'm West Australian, so we all do it very well, by the way. Um, <laughs> whether they're scientists, it's interesting working with scientists and then working with people in sociology type area, completely different ways of communication. And because you are a technical expert doesn't mean you're very good at managing people or dealing with humans. Um, whether you're single or in a relationship, um, your sexual preferences, we all communicate differently. The big challenge for me has been in high and low context cultures. So low context cultures being predominantly English as a first language, so Western culture um, in the first world, including Germany and Israel, low context being everybody else in the world. So how you communicate with somebody from any Asian nation, African nation, Middle Eastern nation, South American, in Indigenous Australia is the highest high context culture, will influence um, whether you are clean and clear in that, and they will take the message from it. The tool I use to remain clean and clear, you, I would say pick your own. Find some way that you have a pattern of a conversation. I use the work of a man named Jervis Bush um, in the Experience Cube. So my conversations are around observations. What data do I have? Thoughts is how I've interpreted that data my feelings around the information, and what are my needs and wants around that. So every conversation I have, including those with my family, are basically around that uh, tool, the experience cube. The reason I practice it in safe environments is because when the proverbial hits the fan, when somebody's literally chest poking me, or worst case scenario, has a gun in my face, it's there. So when I'm threatened, it's there. It's not something I have to try and remember. It's a habit, it's a, con it's a way that I communicate. So I use it to reflect, to reflect and prepare. Before I have a conversation, I go around this tool. I use it to listen and be curious and I use it to deliver my message. And my overall stance, and regardless of what's been said to me, I want to approach from a stance of curiosity rather than certainty. Because inevitably, I'm going to learn something. And I don't have to say things that, that then invites them to prove me wrong. If I'm curious, I can get more information. So clear communication, curiosity. My third one is establish clear boundaries. Um, I mentioned earlier when I talk with women in conflict, they often aren't behaving the way they would like to behave. And one of the things I had to do when I took on these 56 men at 20 was decide how I wanted to behave. What were my boundaries? What was acceptable and what wasn't acceptable? Regardless of what the law says, what wasn't or was acceptable for me? And that included, I mean, I was a 20-year-old girl, single, and I had 56 men of which, I don't know, probably 40 of them were between 23 and 28. It was like dropping a kid in a chocolate factory. The reality is, and they're all tradies, so at that time they're all fit, they're all young, they're all, you know, they're in the Navy. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'll stop there. <laughs> They're rich. <laughs> well, they were. Um, I had to set really clear. <laughs> so, see? <laughs> I 
I had to set really clear boundaries. And it's interesting when I talk to people, women especially, who get into trouble and they're behaving outside their expectations, they often say to me, and I'll quote, I'm doing it this way because if I don't, people won't like me or people won't respect me or people won't think I'm competent at my job. Um, so they're actually behaving incongruent with themselves because of their own assumptions on somebody else's expectations. So establish clear boundaries, understand what is okay and what's not okay, and as you move up, and I imagine many of you have experienced that, many of you will, you'll be promoted within the same work group. You have to renegotiate it. So now you're in a supervisor role, that's no longer one of the troops. You renegotiate those boundaries. How am I going to be here? How am I going to be, or how are they going to treat me? How am I going to set those boundaries? So in that understanding, what is my authority, accountability and responsibility? And how, through my own actions, can I actually, um, or what do I need to be certain of to be able to delegate that and gift that to the people who work for me? So that they, I'm demonstrating and modelling to them the trust, respect that I expect from them. So that was my third point. I'm moving through. The third, fourth one, which is what saved me as a mother and a wife in the first instance, but also saved me in my current work role. It's, and it's called appreciative inquiry. There's lots and lots of research out there. But I am very adept at finding what's not working, as most of us are. I am very adept at seeing what I don't like. Um, and, and it includes coming back to the dress, looking at, at what people are going, oh, I don't like that, or well, that doesn't suit them. So what appreciative thinking is about is shifting your, the way you think to looking for what you want more of and what's working. Um, and looking for, because the, the truth of nature is what we put energy into grows. I mean, my veggie gardens are example of that. I ignore it, I get nothing. If I spend two hours a day with it, I get a beautiful crop. So what we put energy into grows. So it's changing my thinking to saying, if I want more respect in my workplace, then I need to not only ask for it, but acknowledge it when it arrives and thank people for it when it arrives. What it actually gave me is relief from having to be, as I moved up, as I got more senior, I don't have to be the expert. I don't have to have all the answers appreciative thinking was. I just had to ask more questions. Um, and it took the pressure off me. I mean, it, meant, oop, it meant I'd just ask more questions. So thinking appreciatively. Point five is, now if you nail this, I'm out of a job. The reality is. Because this is where I make my money and do my living now. Because people avoid managing the difficult stuff. The first part is managing ourselves. And there's a quote or I wanted to read to you. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you make them feel. Um, and that's from an author and poet named Maya Angelou. And that's what this is about. The first person you're going to manage is yourself. So, and this isn't my exercise, but I wanted to share with you. There's a half glass of water here. Many of you will be expecting me to ask you, is it half empty or half full? But my question is, is how much do you think this weighs? Any guesses? Anybody? About 200 grams? Anyone else? 300? It's a pretty thick glass. The point is not really how much it weighs. If I hang on to it for two or three minutes, it's OK. If I hang on to it like this for an hour, what do you think will be happening? Sorry? Yeah, it feels heavier. And what might be happening to my arm? That's it. <laughs> Everybody's gone to find the ladies and gents. Um, if I hang on to it for an hour, I'm going to get a sore arm. If I hang on to it for a day, my whole body will start to ache. If I hang on to it for 10 years, so if we think of this as the stress, the angst, the pissed offness that we get, the buttons being pushed in the workplace, if we hang on to it for an hour, it's OK. If we hang on to it for a day or two days, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. So the first part of managing our own defensiveness is how can I manage my own reactivity? what's going on for me, so that I'm not still carrying it 10 years later and behaving incongruent with how I want to be. So manage that first. 
I can remember when I was referred to that one that says, I don't have to be right or they be wrong, I just need to create new thinking. The moment I stopped thinking I had to prove to every man that I worked with <laughs> that I was good enough, I became good enough. Because I then started working for myself rather than for them. So I stopped having to prove them right or wrong. And I remember being referred to as the token woman. Previous times I would have tried to prove that what that meant, but now I just say to them, well, you're paying me a lot of money. How do you want me to earn it? So I don't even need to engage with it. The challenging conversations include the cross-cultural ones, and we've mentioned that. We aren't all from the same culture. How can we engage? Mental health. You know, the stats say 33% of us in this room have a mental health issue. Disabilities. The ones that are most challenging aren't those that are visible. It's those slight hearing loss. The bottom one is where I make my money, poor performance. If people have any of those above, we avoid telling them they're not doing a good enough job. So have those conversations. And very quickly, my last point, what is work-life balance for me? This is the big one. I went, had to visit my doctor in January to get a, a medical review. And she said to me, the worst thing that women do is, or the biggest failing of successful women is believing they have to do it all. They're still retaining all the traditional duties in the household, or traditional duties in the families, or traditional duties elsewhere, and being successful at what they do for a living. So it's accepting that I don't have to do it all. So please don't visit my house this weekend. Uh, and taking care of myself, not creating the rods for my own back. The other one is understanding my purpose. So what does a career look like in this organisation? Why am I here? How am I adding value? So that I can ask for it and move towards it. Um, and looking for the joy in everything. That's the appreciative mindset. If the, the more I complain, the more I'm going to get of whatever that is. Look for what's bringing me joy. Now, I didn't get to go to the UN or anything like that because I applied for a job. None of the cool stuff I've done have has ever been advertised. All the cool stuff I've done in my career has been because I thought, that was cool, I'm going to write a letter. And I've said, dear whoever. My name is Lindley Cornish. This is the experience I have. I'd like to add value to your organisation. And it's only two or three times they've said no. If they say no, I'm no worse off. Otherwise, I ended up in Italy in Brindisi buying some really good boots with 193 nations and been the only woman presenting to the United Nations. Thank you very much. <laughs>